Fallout Equestria the Chrysalis, Chapter 19, Part 3 I woke to find that I was oddly chilly. Not outright cold, per se, but certainly cooler than I would have preferred. The reason, I discovered on opening my bleary eyes, was that I had only a small corner of the blanket draped across my side. Turning my head further, I found where the rest had gone. Starlight was tangled up in the blanket, most of which had ended up in a bundle, with her legs wrapped around it. I gave my corner of the blanket a light tug, but she simply pulled the blankets in tighter, murmuring faintly. I released, and the corner slowly slid from my side. Sighing, I took that as a sign to get up. I gave a long, slow stretch. My body really did feel much better, before sliding out of bed. The motion finally woke Starlight, who groaned softly into the blankets, moving around a bit before lifting her head and looking over her shoulder. Then she made a sound that roughly approximated, Good morning. Good morning. I echoed back, much more clearly. Should I be getting us a second blanket? She blinked a couple of times, before fully processing what I had asked. Then a hint of a blush touched her cheeks, and she kicked her legs, quickly disentangling herself, and spreading out the blanket again. Sorry, I... I, I didn't sleep very well last night. Maybe you should try getting some more sleep. I said. Oh, you don't have anything going on today. She hesitated for a moment, then grunted and kicked off the blankets. No, I, I should get up. She said, quickly rolling off of the edge of the bed and onto her hooves. I mean, I don't want to spend all day in bed, after all. She stood stiffly, her expression a little too tight. I cocked an eyebrow. Are you bothered by how last night went? What? No! She quickly replied. Dazzle will have to work a lot harder to bother me. I blinked, then opened my mouth to speak again, but she cut me off. We should get breakfast. I'm hungry. She turned and walked briskly to the door and I couldn't help but note that she was keeping her tail tucked low between her legs. Not bothered, indeed. Dusty looked up from a book as we entered, and smiled. Oh, good morning. He gestured with a hoof at the table, where an ancient coffee pot sat beside a plate with a few carrots and apples. Emerald made some coffee and insisted on sharing. It should still be hot. Starlight descended on the food with a passion, while I took a somewhat more leisurely pace. I even had some of the coffee. I don't normally care for the taste, but a bit of caffeine was sounding like a good idea. As I sat back with a carrot and a well-worn mug of lukewarm coffee, I looked down at the book Dusty held. What's that? Some war story Emerald rented me for a cap, he replied. A special team goes into the Zero Lands to assassinate their Caesar and end the war. I gave a dry chuckle. So it's fiction, I see. Is it any good? It's entertaining enough, Dusty said. Just as long as I overlook how the combat is basically... nonsense. I smiled. Oh, um, speaking of which, are you still willing to go shooting today? He nodded. Sure, just say when. I tip back the cup, draining it dry. How about now? He shrugged. Let me get to the end of the chapter, then sure. Starlight looked up from the apple that she was halfway through. <laughs> she paused, swallowing an overly large bite, and tried again. <laughs> hey... Do you mind if I tag along? <laughs> well, it's not like you need my permission to use Arclight's range, Dusty said with a chuckle. But, eh, sure, might as well make it a party. We set out shortly after we had gathered a small collection of weapons, ammunition, and equipment. Dusty purchased the set of earplugs for both Starlight and myself, and then led us back to our wagon. When we arrived, we found Sickle, her shoulders wedged under the wagon, as she did push-ups, lifting the whole vehicle, cargo and all, with each repetition. Starlight was naturally the first to speak upon seeing the odd scene. Sickle, what the hell are you doing? Sickle paused, her chin nearly touching the ground. The fuck does it look like I'm doing? Uh... Sickle blinked. I'm exercising! She pushed herself up again, the contents of the wagon rattling. I ain't been going around in my armor and hauling shit all the time. Gotta do something to keep in shape. She sneered a bit as she lowered and pushed herself up again. T what you think I got this big lying around and fucking all the time? Starlight frowned. I just thought it was the buck. Eh, sure. <sighs> that helps. Sickle said with a shrug that shook the wagon. Dusty stepped up beside the wagon. Think you could stop for a sec? We need to get some stuff. She didn't stop. So? Get the stuff. You like I can't lift your ass too? Dusty sighed, then grabbed the edge of the wagon and hauled himself up. The extra weight seemed to mean nothing to Sickle. 
He balanced atop the wagon with remarkable ease as he dug through the equipment within, and eventually hopped down with three of the suppressors that he had acquired in the hive. Two went into his bags, while the last one of the two smaller ones he held out to me. I took it, though I gave him a questioning look. You know I don't have subsonic ammunition for my rifle, right? They're still useful, for lots of reasons, he said, closing the flap of his bag and motioning for us to follow. But today, the only reason that matters is that it's easier on the ears. We made our way to the range, and after Dusty and I fixed the suppressors to our rifles, started shooting. Starlight went at it with gusto, popping pieces of scrap, old cans, and broken bottles with her weapons. She even spent a while with both weapons out, giggling as she used her targeting spell to employ them simultaneously against multiple targets. Dusty was a good deal slower and more methodical, first spending some time carefully tuning the pair of rifles that he had brought, the older, heavier rifle, and an assault rifle like my own before going for a more combat-style shoot, where he rapidly engaged multiple targets, placing two rounds on target before switching to the next. Each shot still produced the sharp crack of the bullet flying down range, but between the earplugs and the suppressor, even his heavy rifle had lost its ear-pounding bark. As for myself, well, I mostly missed a lot. After my third shot missing a stationary bottle halfway across the small field, I looked over to Dusty. Think you can get me some pointers here? I feel like I'm doing something wrong. We're not teaching today, he said, peering down his sights as he made a tiny adjustment. This is just for fun. Well, it'd be a lot more fun if I could hit anything, I said, laying the bitterness on a bit too thick. I'm not even sure if the sights on this thing are accurate. He considered that for a moment before offering to give my weapon a try. I hefted it over, and he took the bit. Hmm. He said, staring down the sights for a moment. Well, you've got the sights set to 300 yards, and you're shooting about 50, but that should only put you a couple of inches high. Firing! A moment later, the rifle cracked, and the bottle went tumbling, the upper half of it vanishing in a burst of glass shards. Yeah, a couple inches at most, Dusty said, then shifted his aim. He fired another three inches, kicking up a thin cloud of dirt behind the board, sticking out of the ground. Setting my rifle down, he lifted his binoculars to look closer at his work. Yep. Sights are good. Holds a decent pattern, too. He picked up my rifle again and passed it back to me. But just take your time. If you want to get used to aiming it, shoot one of those boards out there. Pick a clear mark to aim at, fire a few rounds, then glass it to see where they land. Okay. I said, taking the bit in my mouth and squeezing the stock against my shoulders. I leaned in, peering through the rear sight to line up the front, then lined the front sight up on the same mark that he had been shooting. I tongued the trigger, and the rifle made its strangely muted click crack as a puff of dirt boiled up from behind the board. A couple more, Dusty said, looking through his binoculars. I fired twice more, taking my time. When I had finished, he nodded. Not bad. Not bad. I grabbed my binoculars and peered through them. While I could see some of the holes unaided, it gave me a much better picture of my accuracy, which as expected, was not terribly good. A small X was painted in near the middle of the board. A couple inches above that was a jagged and uneven hole that I could see easily without the binoculars, but which I could now see were likely the result of Dusty's three rounds striking at nearly the same point. A couple of smaller holes were scattered loosely above that, just a couple inches higher, and a third hole pierced the board a good six inches off to the side. I lowered my binoculars. Not bad. I'd hate to see what you would count as bad. Oh, we got some work ahead of us, Dusty said, the corner of his mouth inching upward. But you put every round on the board, almost held a pattern, and didn't shoot yourself, so you're already above average for a beginner. Plus, you kept your eyes open when you shoot. I quirked an eyebrow questioningly at him, but he merely gestured out towards the field again. Enough lessons for now. Go on. He flashed a smile and turned back to his own weapons. I settled into shooting, firing a few rounds before looking through my binoculars to get a good idea of where I was hitting. Slowly, the holes drifted more reliably together. When I started on the second magazine, I even adjusted the range on my sights. When I found out that they only went down to 100 yards, I switched to shooting the distant line of targets, set at about that distance. My last 10 rounds all landed in a pattern that was just about the size of my head, with a single stray off to the side. I smiled as I scoped it out, a small bit of pride building within me. I was making progress. I never really understood why ponies might find firing off guns at inanimate objects for no discernible purpose to be an engaging form of entertainment. Yet, there I was, 
Starlight was giddy the whole way back to the inn, thoroughly enthused by the experience with her targeting spell, and retelling several of the fancier tricks, as if we hadn't been there to see them. Dusty remained relatively quiet, though he wore a faint smile. It further amused me to reflect on that, and just how much the social dynamic had changed between those two. I might even go as far to call them friends. Emerald was distracted by a merchant who had just arrived in town, so we simply waved and headed up to our room. As we climbed the stairs, Dusty asked us, So, what are you planning to do with the rest of the day? While Starlight shrugged, I replied, I think I'll sit down with my mother's data store and see if I can recover anything. I should have the tools for it now. Dusty's smile slipped. I'm not sure if you're getting the idea of relaxing and having fun. What? I said, frowning at him. Working with computers is fun. It would also be a productive use of my time, but I figured that reasoning wouldn't carry much weight at the moment. If you say so, he said, his tone full of doubt. Just remember, we're supposed to be relaxing. I'm gonna be kicked back in bed, playing with a digital puzzle. I said, smiling again to sell the story. It'll be plenty relaxing. He huffed out a faint chuckle, but didn't object. So, when I got back to my room, I pulled out one of the new terminals from the Hive, and its collection of software tools, and the data store my queen had left behind. I set them on the bed, lying out as I hook things up. Starlight came in as well. I think I might kick back and read some. She said, lifting her pit book. Maybe you listen to some music. Uh, you don't mind, do you? No, of course not. I said, connecting the old data store. A data backup tool made copying over the corrupted contents quick and easy. Starlight laid out on the end of the bed. That was fun. She said, flashing a smile my way. Looks like you were enjoying it too. I nodded. I feel a little less useless too. I said. The transfer completed in only a couple of seconds. There wasn't much there. Oh, hey, you're certainly not useless. She laughed as she pulled out a set of earbuds. Hell, you kicked some serious flank in Merford. Sneaky, now that I can do. The size of the data store's contents might have been a huge number of text files or perhaps a single audio log. I was hoping for the latter, and with the context of why the device had been left behind, it seems the likely answer. Starlight inserted one of the earbuds, then paused. So, uh... I, I, I was wondering something. Yeah? The data recovery tool loaded, slowly displaying what it could make of the corrupted file structure. Well, you feed... She paused, glancing towards the door, then spoke again in a quieter tone. You feed on love. So... Uh, does making love actually... You know, make love? I blinked and looked up from my terminal. I was rather concerned about why she would ask a question like that, but my immediate response was simply... What? It's just that Dazzle seems to have an interest in you. Starlight quickly explained, gesturing with one of her hooves in the general direction of the gate. And I know you need love to survive, and have been pretty hungry at times, and... Well, I know you were getting a bit angry with her, but then you let her off easy, and I was just wondering if that might... You know, be able to help you? I relaxed and chuckled. Thank you for your concern, but you don't have to worry. I'm getting enough from you and the others to keep myself healthy. Oh! Okay. She nodded. Good. In any case, it doesn't quite work that way. Making love is just a euphemism. Sex doesn't produce love. I shrugged. Not in itself, anyway. It can be a very useful tool for manipulating ponies, including in ways that could develop further affection, but I never had a use for that. She tilted her head ever so slightly. Why's that? Because I don't like manipulating ponies. I smiled. Sure, I'll do it when it's necessary, but remember, I was a love collector. I gathered food for the hive, and most of the ponies that I interacted with were regular folks. I didn't need to use sex or any other manipulation to build affection. I just made friends. I paused, then chuckled softly. It could possibly be used to maintain a relationship, though, or further one. Oh. Um. Did you... Uh. Make use of that? I paused, considering her for a moment, but honesty still seemed like the best policy. There were a few times where relationships developed to that point. I said, though my ears drooped a bit as I said it. I try to avoid it, though. Ponies tend to associate intercourse with strong attachments, which I try to avoid. 
I might be recalled or reassigned, and I didn't want to hurt some pony by suddenly breaking off a relationship that they felt strongly about. It was easier if it never got to that point. Her ears perked up. Curious. Even if it would get you more love? I mean, it, it would, right? Oh, well, sure. I said, nodding a little. But I could get enough without it. It was better for everyone that way. But you still... did with some of them. On occasion. She stared at me, expectantly, and I held out for several seconds before giving in with a sigh. Well, there was Lucky. That was a mistake for all the reasons I gave. Though, I, I thought he wouldn't attribute too much significance into intimacy, but he did. I try to ease things down, but it just soured things between us. On the other hoof, there was Tumbleweed, and <laughs> he even choked that he was the dumbest stallion in all of Appaloosa, but that wasn't fair. He wasn't book smart at all, but he was clever enough and probably the nicest and most genuine pony in that town. I... I think he was the only one who really knew I could never be anything more than a good friend, but he was okay with that. Even after he married Mayflower, we remained close. And then there was Sweet Treat. I smiled. She was one of the most flirtatious and playful ponies in town, though much more selective than some ponies asserted. We were best friends and had very similar outlooks on intimacy. There were no complications there, and she reminded me of Desire, which I think is what first caught my attention. Because she reminded you of Desire? Yeah. I said, chuckling a little. Desire was always the flirtatious one. Very friendly and playful. I think of Dazzle only much more talented. Starlight grimaced. Ugh. I hope she really wasn't like Dazzle because I only mean superficially. I said, smiling. Dazzle is flirtatious, but she's a bit blunt about it. Desire, though? She was a natural at appealing to a pony's desires. So... She was good, huh? Oh, yeah, I said, nodding. I didn't see her work out in the fields, of course, but I saw plenty during training. She knew better than to pursue things too aggressively with someone that she wanted to seduce, like what Dazzle was doing. She could tease just enough to pull you off balance and get you excited, but could keep things subtle and slow enough that you'd feel comfortable with every single move that she made. She made Dazzle's shower and massage look amateur. Huh. Starlight was staring off into space, and I caught her shifting her position slightly, her tail curling in close alongside her. It wasn't hard to see where the conversation was taking her mind, so I quickly moved on. I was always more like Shadow, though, or Ripple. We were the quiet ones of the group. Subtle, I suppose. Shadow was much sneakier than me, though. I don't have a clue what they had her doing, but I'm sure that she excelled in it. Starlight's eyes refocused as she shifted her position again, taking advantage of the distraction to further change the subject. So, did you have a lot of pony friends? Yeah. I said and gave a little chuckle. Enough that it was practically a full-time job to keep up with all of them. She nodded slowly. How come you never talk about any of them? My smile slowly faded. The question hung in the air for several long seconds before I quietly replied. Just over a month ago, I helped throw Meadowlark's 25th birthday party. The week before that was a full shower for Tumbleweed and Mayflower. Then there were the dinners with Lagerda Main and Marble Hoof, and my weekend vacation in Manhattan with Sweet Treat. I slowly shook my head. Then I wake up here, and they've all been dead for 200 years. Starlight's expression wilted. I'm sorry, it's not your fault, I said, then quickly added. Thank you. She looked down at her hooves, chewing on her lip. After a moment of silence, I touched my portable terminal. I should really get to work on this. Oh, uh, yeah, I, I... I guess so. She gave an awkward smile and, after a moment, turned back to her pit book, slipping an earbud into her ear. I drew in a deep breath, sighed, and returned to my work. The copied contents still sat there, unreadable. The data recovery tool was unable to make heads or tails of the file or files. That didn't really surprise me. Whatever was there was almost certainly encrypted, which would complicate data retrieval. The plus side was that the encryption was almost certainly one of the more commonly known methods the Hive used to ensure that we could reveal our message. I spent a while messing with the various software tools in an attempt to find an easy solution, but none were able to produce anything significant. 
except to finally single out the actual data from the damaged spell matrix that contained it. A quickly written script iterated through various ciphers and keys, outputting a new file for each one in the hopes that one of them would decode into a meaningful file. Slowly, meaningless jumbles of random values filled out the output directory, and then one of the files resolved as a valid audio file. I stared, my ears standing on alert as a hint of adrenaline burned in my gut. Starlight noticed my reaction, removing one of her earbuds, and looking at me with a concerned expression. I took a slow breath. I... I, I think it might have worked. Starlight's ears perked, and she sat up. I stared down at the portable terminal, the audio file highlighted waiting for me. I took a slow, deep breath, turned on the speakers at a low volume, and pressed play. The sound from the speaker was marred by the occasional bit of static or squelch of distortion, but none of that could hide the beautiful, melodious voice of Queen Ephema. Hello, my children. I am sorry that I cannot be there for you. The chrysalis that had protected me has failed. I can only assume for the good condition of the others that my body has put greater demands upon it, and that this has led to its failure. As I look at all of you, sleeping peacefully, I at least can take some comfort that you all are safe and healthy. I cannot open the door. Even if I were able to override the lockdown, I could not. The terminal here tells me troubling things. I find it hard to believe that 80 years could have passed, all in a single, dreamless sleep. I never imagined this endeavor would have lasted this long, but it seems it must continue even longer. According to the terminal, the outside world is poison. If I stay here, I will slowly starve. But if I open the door, we will all die. I can't do that. As your queen, my greatest duty must be to maintain the well-being of our hive. Even if that means sacrificing my own life so that others may survive. Please, do not mourn me. My choice, as ever, is made for the good of the hive. The hive needs you now more than it needs me. As sad as I am to know that I will never see you again. I can feel only pride as I look upon you now. Our home is gone, lost to the balefire that has consumed the world. But our hive is more than a hole in the ground. It lives on in you. Gossamer, trickle, whisper, slab, bolt, surge, midnight, aegis, slip. The task ahead of you is great, but I trust in you. You are all here because you are the greatest, the most capable that our hive has to offer. You will lead the hive into the future. For you, I leave all the love I still hold. Take it. Find your sisters. Ensure that our hive lives on. I love you all. Goodbye. The recording clicked off, and I heaved a deep, shuddering breath. Tears were running down my cheek, but I found myself smiling. Starlight scooted up close beside me, a foreleg slipping around my shoulders to give a gentle squeeze. As I reached out to tenderly brush a hoof along the portable terminal, she said, She sounds nice. My first attempt to speak was just making a sound halfway between a sob and a chuckle. My second attempt was a little more coherent. She was. I was afraid I'd never get to hear her voice again. Yeah. Starlet said softly. It helps. I leaned into her, and while I had to wipe the tears from my cheek, my smile grew a little more. Yeah. She gave another gentle squeeze. You okay? I sniffled, but nodded. Yeah, yes, yes. This... Th this is good. I looked at the terminal for a moment. And I was right. I have a purpose. 
and we'll do everything that we can to help you, Starlight said, offering a smile. Thank you, I said, my voice cracking. And, um, if you ever need to talk about any of this stuff, you know... I gave a weak chuckle. I wouldn't even know where to start. She thought for a moment. Well, maybe tell me more about your sisters, or your friends? I swallowed, hesitant but nodded. Okay. Nothing like some very emotional and sometimes even very personal character development, but it's the best shit that you can get when it comes to learning more about a character. Anyway, I'd love to give a very special thank you to my hive of donators. Top donator, Dash of Evergreen, Peter Coltard, Dresden, Dospo, Runescythe9852, Courier Crucii, Delta Omega, Ryan E. Dragonwolf, Dwight Cornell, Gaggy, Secret Moon, Tal Rasha, The Toilet Snake, Soul Dragon, Starlight Glimmer, Squiddy Boy, David D. Sanchez, Trey, Pokey Killer Zack, Dak Britton, Joe Piercy, Alex F., Rainbow Dash, James Dalton, and Teal K. Anderson. Thank you all very much for watching this video, and live life to the fullest.